And then I think following me is George, who's going to go into a lot more of the statistical um, analysis there. So um, just the objectives for today's talk is just to um, help you understand how we uh, analyze and align untabbed, un, excuse me, untargeted metabolomics data, um, some of the quality control measures we use, um, and then also um, to understand the report we would send to you for untargeted metabolomics. And where we are in the workflow, <laughs> as you guys have seen this a lot, is, is right here. Um, really the data processing, um, less so the statistical analysis, because uh, George will talk about that, but really how we process all this data, because there's a lot of it. OK, so to talk a little bit about the workflow for how we analyze and targeted data, um, I'm going to refer back to this a couple times. and. Forgive me for skipping back and forth, but I just want to start here with the sample raw MS data. So as I showed in my earlier talk and several people have, talk, have shown, um, you know, mass spec data comes out as a molecular ion plus or minus a charge usually, um, and some of the isotope peaks that come with it. Um, and so the, at the very least, in terms of your data reduction, uh, the first thing you can do is say, well, instead of calling each one of those things an individual peak, let's at least, you know, collapse the molecular ion and its isotopes together and call that a feature. And so you've heard the word feature a couple times now. <laughs> and it's purposely called a feature for a number of reasons, which I'll get into, um, because we don't know that everything in the spectrum is a true endogenous metabolite that you're interested in, so we just call it features to start with. Um, and a feature, like I said, it has the the feature of having <laughs> um, uh, more than one peak in it sometimes. Like I said, it's that parent ion. It could be um, the isotopes that are also associated with that. Um, I'm going to come back to what we do after that. So I just want to show you a little bit about, um, you know, analyzing features and detecting them. So, um, you know, we've shown a few total ion chromatograms now. This is the, all the signal coming in, into the detector of the mass spectrometer at any given time. Um, feed, uh, total line chromatograms are sort of dominated by a few peaks usually that uh, are really abundant species um, that kind of drive what the chromatogram looks like. But kind of what I wanted to show here was, as opposed to a target analysis where, uh, you know, you may, based on your extraction method um, and the type of separation you're doing and the type of instrument you're using, um, see, uh, you know, slightly cleaner spectrum with just that, again, uh, the molecular ion plus or minus the charge and its isotopes. In, when you're looking at the total ion chromatogram, okay, first of all, I have to back up and say, I'm only looking at a very small mass range here. But I think you can extrapolate, if you're looking over here, at what's going down, down here, that there's a lot more of these type of molecular ions and the spectrum is a lot busier in an untargeted um, type of study. Um, and uh, so, you know, essentially just wanted to also emphasize the mass range that we're looking at when we're doing untargeted me metabolomics. Um, you know, at any given time coming off of the uh, HPLC chromatogram, you're going to see a lot of ions, anywhere from 50 up to 1,000 Daltons. And there's a lot of information buried in that down there. So how do we get that information out, and how do we reduce that data to make it manageable? And um, as I stated, we're going to extract what's called a feature. Um, and we can do that any number of ways. We can just take the molecular ion and its isotopes, or we can start looking at what are some other events that can happen to those ions. Can they pick up sodium? Can they pick up potassium? If I have ammonia in my buffer, will they pick up pneumonium? Um, if I have a, uh, you know, if I'm in negative mode, will they lose a, a proton, I mean, sorry, yeah, lose a proton or pick up a chlorine? So this is software that is, again, kind of specific to our Agilent instruments, but um, is sort of the basis for our platform um, of trying to reduce this data a little bit further and trying to say, we know that when we see a mass spectrum, certain ions are associated with each other based on these likely events of what will happen, um, that they may pick up a sodium as well as just pick up a proton, for example, and that those things, if they're coming out at the same retention time and kind of have the same peak shape, are most likely 
related ions, and we can collapse them down into sort of one feature. Um, this is one approach, and I just want to say that another approach would be to not do this and to just pick out all the features um, separately and then go back and try to do correlation later and reduce the data set on your own or through another means. So, um, but at, for now, I'm going to talk about this as, as a possible basis for how to reduce the complexity of that spectrum. So, just to show this in sort of real life, <laughs> if you have a really large, uh, uh, you know, fairly abundant ion that might be present um, in your spectrum, you know, in a large amount, you may see quite a lot of different um, uh, forms of that of that compound in your spectrum. And here, the molecular ion, the, the uh, protonated form, is not even the most intense. Really, the sodiated ion is the most intense. And then there's a little bit of uh, that ion with potassium. And even down here, uh, there's a little bit of the dimer with the sodium ion um, adduct. So two of these together with one sodium. And so again, this is what the software may try to do. It may try to collapse all that down into sort of one feature. I uh, just wanted to show, um, when it does that, it does kind of output what we call a compound or a feature, and those uh, compounds or features carry with it all the information of all the ions that were collapsed into them. So it's, this is all exported out into an XML format, and so that's easy to retrieve later and figure out, you know, if, if it was doing the same thing consistently amongst... Um, uh, each of the times it extracted that feature. And it was a consistent across samples and that kind of thing. So. Oh, I want to go back. <laughs> um, okay, so at that point, we have, like I said, extracted the molecular features. Uh, the next uh, step, I think, which George referred to a little bit, would be uh, to go across all of the samples and sort of filter for the consistency of these features. You'd like to see... Uh, that, that feature in at least, say, 70% of, uh, all of, the, um, of all of the samples in one group. So it doesn't have to be present in all the groups because it may be something that's only in one, um, control, in one set versus the control, for example. But we're going to go ahead and do some filtering at this point to reduce that down again. Um, you know, we may be starting with as many as 6,000 features and, and trying to reduce that down to a, you know, a couple, two, 3,000 to deal with. Um, the next thing that's going to happen is in between here, the filtering step in here, we're going to create a sort of a library, an on-the-fly library for that analysis, which includes all the features after this reduction that's been, that have been detected in all the samples. So it's kind of like a library just for that study. Um, and at the same time, over here, we have a standard library. So the basis of our platform for Untarget is we've run about a thousand authentic standards um, on our system. We know what retention time they are, what mass, even what is, you know, their likely adducts that uh, we are going to see for each compound. So those um, library entries are, um, you know, their own database. So what we're going to do is take our standard library and create it with our kind of on-the-fly library for those samples, and then go back and run them all through as if it were a database search. So this is a, a recursive part of the analysis where we are trying to say, okay, you've detected a feature in sample one, and you've detected that feature, you know, maybe again in sample two, but it might be missing in some places. And how about if we just open the window up a little bit and say, could this possibly be the same feature even though it's got a slightly different name in sample one versus sample two, and, and can we align them and see if they are indeed the same feature in all the samples? And so going back down, I want to show this figure. Um, when you do that, what you get is a much um, greater uh, percentage of your samples with a frequency of one. Frequency of one means it shows up in all the samples. You, you see that you detect that feature in all the samples. So you can see like the higher end of the you know, frequency uh, plot here is much more populated after you do this recursion than before. Um, 
Okay, so at the same time we're doing this sort of alignment and recursion, uh, the next step is to uh, match those features against either, like I said, the database of all these internal, of all these um, authentic standards that we've run, or uh, we can give them, try to assign a molecular formula to the features if we don't, if we haven't run an authentic standard. I uh, believe that's your, um, sure, not sure if it's, if it's written up here or not. But the idea is here to, um, I think I showed a little bit earlier how the software can sort of look at the isotope distribution and the accurate mass of the compound and try to come up with a molecular formula. And I'll show that more in just a second. Ah, okay, here we go. <laughs> so again, based on what I had shown earlier, you know, trying to assign a molecular formula to a feature based on its isotope distribution and, the, and all the features that have been combined to it. Um, now an alternative approach would be to do more of a targeted approach on the compounds that are in our library. And we're um, looking at this as an alternative um, to sort of feature detection. And the reason for that is that um, feature detection works well, but it, there's sort of a one size fits all um, approach. Uh, you know, you kind of set uh, parameters for the entire chromatogram, such as mass accuracy, retention window that you're looking at um, and such. And this method um, gives us a little bit more control. And I actually didn't show that but it gives you more control where you could set, you know, your retention window and your mass accuracy and all those things on a compound by compound basis. So uh, if we find, you know, in our normal workflow that, you know, there are certain compounds that can benefit from having a little bit more, uh, a little bit more attention to the individual parameters that work better for it, we'll go through and put them through uh, this type of a search engine. And this is actually, what I showed in the targeted method yesterday where uh, you get that nice set of peaks where you can like look at everything align it and make sure it's, uh, it's completely um, uh, integrated in the same way and such. So, so this feature, this method may be used especially for compounds that we know there's difficulty with the feature detection because, because they're kind of variable compared to all the other compounds in the entire chromatogram. So the, the report may be combined report from that feature detection and this sort of more targeted um, approach. Um, so at this point, we've, we've got a couple of different modes of data coming in. We have molecular um, formulas that have been assigned to some peaks. We have names that have been assigned to some peaks. And we want to go back and remove any redundant entries that appear in the samples. In other words, the same data is being reported twice for whatever reason. Um, when this can happen is, um, well, there's a few things. You know, our original library, um, which is created on NEAT standards, uh, may contain um, some uh, isobaric compounds that are very close in retention time. Um, when you run a NEAT standard, you may be able to see those as distinct peaks but under the matrix of your sample, they may no longer be distinct peaks. So uh, as we talked about yesterday, sometimes you have to collapse those down into a single, um, into a single reporting feature. So for example, you know, the hexoses are all sort of just um, collapsed down into a single um, feature. And what we do is we just leave the most biochemically probable, which is the most likely um, that we ex expect to see in the sample. So for example, we just, we might just call the hexose glucose in this case. Um, if we have the same compound that's reported in both positive and negative mode from the HPLC uh, separation in the mass spectrometry reduction, we will report the one that is, um, that is really the best, has the best coverage, whether it's, uh, you know, in 100% of the samples in positive mode, but, you know, maybe you only saw it in a, uh, you know, a few of the samples in negative mode then we'll report the positive mode or the one that has the lowest RSD in the pools, for example, in those pool samples. Um, part of the reason I mentioned that is because, um, you know, each mode is a little bit different. And even though a lot of compounds can be detected in both positive and negative ion mode, their ionization efficiency in those different modes is different. So um, you may, uh, you, 
I wanted to kind of explain that. It's seen 100% of the samples in positive, but only in you know, 80% in negative. That's, that's not because it's, it's really not there, but the instrument um, doesn't pick it up in what negative mode as well. So that's a, an important um, distinction to make that uh, the selectivity of the, you know, where you decide to like report that compound from is important. Um, continue. Um, so sample report kind of looks like this. Um, Again, there's that frequency number. How many of your samples did that appear in? And what I've done here is I've just really sorted by the named compounds. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to show you, for example, you know, you get the area for every sample that you have and then the named compounds. But in reality, um, this is probably a more <laughs> likely scenario. Uh, this one now is probably sorted by intensity. So what you're going to see is some named compounds here, and then um, a lot of compounds of which we were able to uh, to assign a molecular formula. And then occasionally, like at the very top here, you'll see a compound for which we were not able to assign a molecular formula. And that is a, um, just given the name of the molecular ion mass um, and the retention time in which it came out. Uh, some of the things that those might be, there's a few things they could be. Um, you know, if there are environmentally present um, contaminants or, you know, things that have like, you know, multiple chlorines, for example, you know, we may not pick that up because we're, we're picking the most likely uh, biological uh, uh, formula here and, and those don't usually contain for chlorines or such. Um, your report will also contain um, QC information about all the standards that were run and their RSDs uh, within all of the samples. So if you have 100 samples, you know, how well were we able to quantify uh, this, these compounds in those 100 samples? Uh, Sasha Raskin, who does the data analysis, um, will go through and do some preliminary statistics um, on your samples. You can, you know, always meet with him and talk about the results and try to see if there are other techniques you can use or, um, as I think some of the other speakers have suggested, um, start looking at having a <laughs> statistician who can, um, you know, collaborate with you on, on your study so that you can get some statistical support. But um, this is called a discussion, and really it is a discussion because while you know, there may be some PCA plots and some figures that are available, um, and we can clearly see some separation amongst certain, um, you know, a certain groupings of, of, of control or versus treated or whatever the case may be, um, Sasha really puts some thought into uh, really explaining what he thinks the limitations of the studies are or uh, you know, why it worked and things like that, or what next steps may be. So he usually inc includes some pros there about, um, you know, what, what, what the next steps should be if you're, not, if you're not seeing clear separation or whatever the case may be. Um, he is also going to talk, I um, mean, he's also going to um, give you a variety of other tabs within your report, um, including, um, for example, fold change analysis and um, sort of uh, some p-values for some of the compounds. And this is where you really start. This is like the springboard for the next part of the analysis. And later on today, I'm going to talk about recursive analysis for um, untargeted metabolomics. And, you know, once you start seeing some of these features that appear to be, you know, um, highly up or down regulated in one of your uh, groups, how do you go back and then sort out what's going on? And, and it's, um, it's complicated. <laughs> and um, because there's a lot going on um, with, you know, any, uh, any of these experiments where you're detecting thousands of features, um, you have to kind of look at, um, you know, are, are each of these formulas in themselves a unique compound or could they be related to other compounds that are in the, in the um, samples. So in other words, you know, we talked about those multiple forms of the compounds. I showed a spectrum where you have, uh, you know, 
sometimes a dimer and a sodium added to it. Um, those are, you know, normally picked up pretty well by the molecular feature extractor, but the thing that we don't um, frequently ask it to do is to look for neutral loss um, events. Neutral loss is, is when you're um, in the source of the mass spectrometer and the molecule sort of starts to fragment there before it gets in the mass spectrometer. So it's been eluded from the chromatography from the HPLC column exactly the same time as your compound of interest, but when it gets to the source of the mass spectrometer, it starts to fall apart. It gets swept in the mass spectrometer. It gets detected. Um, you know, at the same time as the parent ion, because it's chromatographically, it was moving along with parent ion all along, and it was only at the point when it enters the mass spectrometer that it that it starts to fall apart. So those things you can find correlations because they tend to have really the same peak shape. They tend to start at the same time, end at the same time, things like that. Um, so the next step is to really start looking at, you know, what are some of these things? I'm, there are a lot of other steps, and I think George is going to talk a lot more about that, so I don't want to go into great detail, but the other steps, um, you know, maybe just, okay, let's start with the knowns, what we have, and start looking at some pathways, um, and can we go back and look for additional compounds in that pathway that are upregulated, and, and maybe we, we have them here, but we just don't have the authentic compound in our library, so they may be buried here in these molecular formulas, and, and at this point, we just don't know that because we don't have the authentic compound. Um, again, my talk later is going to go into more detail about like, what we would do to then identify, you know, do we really, can we really tell you that this molecular formula is some compound from some pathway? Um, so I don't want to go into that too much right now. Um, and I think I'm way under time. <laughs> so I guess I'll just take questions right now about the untargeted platform and um, any questions about this talk or just in general, you know, how we do things on the untargeted platform. I think you've heard a little bit from George in terms of how we, you know, do or do not do normalizing if it's needed. Um, so questions right now? Yes, go ahead. So is your metabolite library like a proprietary library that's specific to Agilent? Or like if I have a sample report, can I search it by formula? Okay, so right. So Agilent prevent provides, um, and I, there's a lot of online database searching, um, which is uh, Metlin is the Agilent um, uh, tool, and that also is available online. So it can be done through our software or it can be done online. And I'll show that for MSMS database searching in my next talk. But um, what the only thing is that you may do that and you may come up with some possible names for some of these uh, molecular formulas, but without a retention time, I mean, well, you have the retention time too, but without any context of what that, where it is in the retention time, I mean, it may not be very meaningful, or it might. You know, it really depends. You could always come back to us and say, well, so where does this compound fall in, the, you know, in terms of its sort of hydrophobicity based on other factors, like when it's coming out on the HPLC? So that could give you some additional information um, that might help you. Um, and, and then, yeah, like I said, that's, that's definitely an online tool that's available. Um, I guess I could have shown it, but I'll show it in, in the MSMS talk later. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Okay, go ahead. Yes. So, like you said, usually you will have over uh, thousands of features. So, do you like literally, literally or physically really just go through all the thousands of features to see if they are unique? Or you guys just focus on the very significant ones? Right, and see? that's part of the recursive talk I'll talk about later. It's Mostly the second thing, we look at the significant ones, and then we start from there. So uh, kind of top-down approach of uh, instead of trying to QC every peak of the thousands of features, try to see what's significantly different, and then go from there and approach the significant differences, and can we identify them? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, yes. Um, it looked like in your sample report we get some... And like the very, uh, the last table uh, had some relative abundance column. Uh, oops, okay. Uh, and this or, no. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
This no. is the very last one, so I'm looking at this there, one here. Yeah, there we go. Uh -huh. uh, was it that? Was it that one? Uh, yeah, kind of towards the end, it looked like there was some, some abundance information. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering um, if you guys were doing a comparison of uh, relative abundance and say um, in you in your uh, disease sample you have a compound that's in 16 of the 20 and then in your and you kind of uh, you know kind of assess how much your peak area is for that and then the control it's only found in three mm -hmm. of the samples mm -hmm. um, do you still compare the relative abundance even though it's not in the majority of um, all of the that information is probably more useful as sort of a QC or a target um, in other words based on what we know of what are really strong features like how many counts a really abundant peak is that might give us some information about like which which ones may be just lacking um, presence <laughs> in one of the sets because they're very low to, close to the baseline or things like that. We do have cutoffs for when we do the initial molecular feature extraction, but, um, but the cutoffs aren't really, um, again, you can't, you, the same cutoff doesn't apply throughout the chromatogram, so we don't want to set that too high. We don't want to say um, we only want to pick peaks with area over 20,000 counts because that that could be slightly different, you know, throughout the chromatogram. So we we tend to keep the cutoffs a little bit low, um, and and gather all the information and then filter it later. So this information is probably a little bit more useful um, to sort of look at which targets to go after. And that doesn't really answer your question. <laughs> so your question is, um, what would you do if you saw it, you know, basically in 16 of your controls and only three of your um, of your disease state, for example, right? I mean, that's your basic question. Right. Um, you know, the first thing would be just to go back and like sort of manually inspect the spectra and see, um, you know, what's what's going on there and seeing, you know, if in the disease samples um, it's really present for some reason and we're not we're not picking it up. Um, and, you know, there may be some statistical approaches that can help do that as well. Um, but, yeah, I would I would say uh, at that point you know, it's more of a consultation. We, we start talking about the data and we start talking about what needs to happen next to kind of analyze it. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> so in a roundabout way. Um, any other questions right now? Yes. So when you're using the Agilent products such as uh, Qual and uh, uh -huh. MPP, when you do a positive and negative mode, do you then export the, before you import it into MPP, do you export it as a CSV file and then collate the two files and then re-import it back into MPP? Um, we do, we export it all as Chef, which is all the Chef Agilent files. format, yeah. Then do you treat the positive minus, or positive and negative modes as separate? We do, we treat them as separate and then we combine it at the end. Okay. Yeah, and then just go back and do, I think Sasha's written a um, tool to make sure that we, um, you know, eliminate any redundancies between the two when we report. And again, like I said, mostly that's because you already have enough stuff to look at. You don't want to have to see the same compound in both modes. We pick the one that is best. Yeah. So, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So like a gene expression data, so sometimes, let's say, if we look at the gene expression, like 40,000 40, genes, we expect to see like maybe 20,000 of genes might be expressed, like about 50% of the genes. So do you have that kind of, kind of sense, like all the untargeted metabolites, how many of metabolites should be there, and or like a tissue-dependent manner. So in adipose tissue, we should be seeing those metabolites, while in plasma, we should be seeing those metabolites. Yeah, I'm going to kick that back to Chuck if he's here. Chuck here. Um, I think he's done more of the integration of the data sets. Um, so can we hold that question until a little later? I think um, I, our experience is more experiential with regards to um, mass spectrometry in particular. So what we do know is that, um, you know, tissues tend to be more rich than plasma in terms of the overall metabolites we see. Um, and that combining multiple platforms, if we do LC and GC and HILIC, um, clearly you're not seeing everything. I mean, I'm sorry, if you're doing reverse phase LC, GC and HILIC, clearly you're not going to see everything in reverse 
phase LC that you may see if you pick up some of these other methods. So, um, so I would say that in, unless you look at the multiple chromatography conditions, you know, you're not going to be able to compare that necessarily, the gene expression, to just one mode of chromatography. But if we looked at all three of those together, we might be able to make some, some a little more correlation with that. But again, I have to, I have to talk to Chuck, because he's starting to do more of the integration of the omics and sort of above my pay grade right now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and to be a little more specific about that, our untargeted platform contains lipids, but nowhere near what we see if we went into lipidomics platform, because just the extraction method itself is going to, um, you know, we're only going to pick up a subset of the lipids. Um, so that follow-up question is like mm -hmm. so, like similar to along to that line. So, do you have like any effort, like a tissue atlas of the metabolites, like? Uh, map of that, let's say, in pancreas, we should be seeing those metabolites and the plasma. Right, we yeah. Be seeing those, um, uh, there's those definitely. Kind of effort there, or well, there's no use for that? Uh, whatever is out there in the literature, basically. You know, yeah. I mean, you have to do all some metabolites that are present at certain uh, tissues. Yeah. Right. So and uh, there, that was actually a topic of some um, of the discussions at ASMS this year where they, you know, that's one of the goals of, of the community at large is to sort of start mapping, even if they're unknowns, uh, which ones are we seeing in which types of tissues so that we can, you know, have a broader sense of, uh, of, you know, what's sort of normal for a tissue, even if it's just an unknown. So, I mean, our efforts really, we haven't, I haven't done that on our own yet, but uh, it, that strikes me as something that we're always collaborating with the instrument companies um, that you know we may be asked to do at any day, any day here. So um, keep in mind that for metabolomics it's sort of very safe. So if you think, think about the you know, gene expression sensitivity or something, you know, gene expression sensitive years ago, I think that's where we are with uh metabolomics as a community. Lee, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so we can, yeah, that part, I don't, I don't know if that, that wasn't really the question, but we could, you know, tell you what, what you should expect from each type in terms of named compounds, but in terms of, I think you were talking in a broader sense of which ones of these features could be real gene products and which ones are not. Um, to be determined. Okay, <laughs> I guess I'm out of time, so thank you very much for your time today.